All right, mate, how you doing? Uh, welcome back to another video. You may not have seen yesterday's video, but this is two in two, which is the sort of upload schedule that you have not seen on this channel in a while. I did explain all that stuff and a lot more in yesterday's video. But today we're here to talk about the Chelsea situation. It is absolutely Kieran and Eric. And by that, I mean, it's dire. OK, it's not a laughing matter, though. It's deadly serious. I mean, there's a lot to talk about here. And first and foremost, I just want to say, like, you know, as with all my opinion pieces on football, you know, I'm not an authority on all these things. I'm not, you know, I'm going to talk about the Ukraine conflict. I'm going to talk obviously about uh, Abramovich and, and his uh, interest in Chelsea and all these things. There's, there's plenty of people that know a lot more than me about these things. I'm picking up bits of information as and when I go, but I don't uh, pretend to be an expert on these things. And I advise you to all do your own research and whatnot. This is really just an opportunity for us to discuss it. I want to hear your comments in uh, the comments below as well. And, um, and, and yeah, what my take on it is. And basically... I'm actually quite sad. Like, I think it's important to say it's the right thing. Like, undeniably, this should be happening, right? Uh, we'll explore it further. But um, I think I just want to be honest about my my immediate reaction when I saw the news. And I want to talk about the news here. I'm not talking about Abramovich being forced to sell Chelsea, which had already happened. I'm talking about these um, sanctions that have come in that actually mean Chelsea is, a well, it would have been completely unable to do any business. It's been given a special license to play its games and do certain things. But um, it's, it's really an unprecedented time for Chelsea Football Club, uh, what they're going through right now. So yeah, as a fan, as a non-Chelsea fan, but as a football fan, I was actually quite sad to see it. And because, I, I mean, there's, there's plenty more victims than this than there is in football. Obviously, this is about actual victims in Ukraine and, you know, people that have died ultimately. Uh, so this is serious stuff. From a football perspective, I was quite sad for the Chelsea fans, to be honest. I think they're getting punished. Now, I know a lot of... I don't want this to get too tribal. It always gets so tribal when these things come up. And it's like certain fans sort of, oh, I'm happy to see Chelsea going through this because they've done this. And we'll talk about what Chelsea haven't haven't done. And we'll try and be objective about that. But at the end of the day, football fans, regardless whether their team's winning or losing, you know, they deserve to be able to support their team. And that's something that um, is not going to be as straightforward going forward. So let, let, let's start at the sort of the beginning. So... A couple of weeks ago, as a result of his links to Putin's government and Russia uh, and what obviously they're doing going into Ukraine. And, you know, it's, it's a whole sort of, uh, for, for want of a better word, minefield that I don't really want to go into. Obviously, I'm against it. I stand with Ukraine. I said that, you know, I've said that on my, my social media and whatnot. You know, I think everyone hopefully is on the same page there. But when it comes to Abramovich and his uh, dealings with with Putin, obviously, I'm not an expert, but I do know what I've seen on the news. And that's not recently either. That's always been talked about. That was talked about when he brought Chelsea, you know, almost 20 years ago now. That was something that was uh, very apparent. They had links and it was an attempt for him to really, as far as I understand it, protect his money. You know, um, he actually had links with Yeltsin, I believe, before Putin. And he was able to basically get stakes in these huge Russian industries. And as a result, he wanted to protect himself against, you know, if, he, if Putin ever came after him, getting some of his interests out of Russia, which is why he bought a football club. I'm not saying Abramovich hasn't loved Chelsea and hasn't done great things for them objectively in terms of on the pitch. But you can't get away from the fact that it was controversial when he took over. And I think, people just got used to it people just got used to it because then the next takeover happened be it Man City or more recently the Newcastle one or many others uh, you know PSG all of them with some contentious well controversy about them but it's really this ugly head again now because of what's happened in Russia and it took their time that UK government they took their time a lot of other countries done sanctions a lot quicker and a lot more uh vehemently on the Russian oligarchs than we did in the UK. But we have come through and basically frozen Abramovich's assets. What does that mean? Well, Chelsea is an asset of his. And it basically means if it wasn't such a special part of the community and football club, it would just be unable to operate whatsoever. Okay, their license to operate has been kind of taken away from them. But the government have allowed Chelsea to continue, albeit under a very different guise. So they can only spend a certain amount of money on travelling to games. So it literally could be the difference between them, you know, flying to games or getting a train, staying in, in the normal hotels they used to, or, you know, not as good hotels. And these, these aren't, you know, life and death situations here. But this is going to be a massive culture shock for Chelsea, I imagine. Any contracts they've got and people that are under contract and staff, they can continue to pay, but they can't sign new players. They can't even extend the contracts currently of players that are about to expire, like Rudiger, like Aspilicueta, you know, someone we know very well on this channel. They can't sell players. They can't bring money in, apart from in the day-to-day the -day operational business, uh, such as playing football matches, basically. It's going to affect their Champions League campaign. They can't spend as much money, so how are they going to be able to pay to do the travelling they need to do abroad? There's a lot of stuff we could talk about there, but we know it's going to affect Chelsea massively. The fans are going to be affected hugely as well in terms of watching games in the stadium um, and away games. So season ticket holders are allowed to honour their tickets, but you can't buy new tickets 
to watch Chelsea now from this point. If you haven't got a season ticket, you can't go away. You're not going to have any away fans at games. And I feel sorry for those fans because they haven't done anything wrong necessarily and they're not ready to support their team just because they don't have a season ticket. I actually do have one. I mean, again, this may have been suggested. I haven't seen it anywhere, but it may have been. But So they don't want Abramovich to make any money. I understand that and I support that. But why can't they allow fans to buy the stuff they normally buy? Merchandise, because the shops have been closed down as well, on going to games and let them go to games. But then just put all that money into a pot that goes to Ukraine. Don't give it to Abramovich. I know that's much more accounting complications, but it seems like the win-win, right? You don't hurt the fans. They've got money they want to spend and it can go to a good cause. Obviously, when Abramovich announced he was going to sell uh, Chelsea a few weeks ago, he actually did make a few gestures within that, that uh, statement, which I have you know, a quite cynical view of, if I'm honest. Um, I don't know Abramovich, I don't know his intentions, but all by all accounts, you know, he's been involved in some pretty nefarious things over the years, right? So I don't necessarily trust that he's got the people of Ukraine's best interests at heart when he says that all the proceeds of his sale are going to go to people in Ukraine or the war in Ukraine. Doesn't even, I don't think it even uh, intimates whether that's Ukrainian casualties or Russian casualties or both or whatever. At the end of the day, he bought Chelsea, I think, for a hundred million pounds about 20 years ago. And he's trying to sell it for what? Two, three, four billion? And then he's saying, I'm not going to claim the one point, however many billion that uh, I'm owed that he's put into the club. But if you're making two, three, four billion on the sale, then you are. Now, this is where you need to understand, and I, I need to understand the definition of the word proceeds, because when he says proceeds going to Ukraine, does that mean every penny from the sale? Or does that mean he's going to recoup what he believes he's spent and he's not going to keep any profits? Because if it's the latter, I've got serious problems with his statement. If he's literally not going to collect a penny, there's no reason why the sale of Chelsea shouldn't go through and the government shouldn't be helping that happen right now and, and make him come through on his word that the, all the proceeds do go to people in Ukraine, people that need it. Ideally, Ukrainians, right? My issue is I don't think Abramovich has come out and like distanced himself from what's happening in Russia. I don't think he's come out that I'm aware of and condemned Putin's actions. Uh, maybe he feels he can't. Maybe he doesn't want to. But until he does that, you can't really sort of trust that his interests are in the right place. And there's a lot of Chelsea fans that love him. They were singing his name at Norwich last night. I understand he's done amazing things for the club. Um, but this is a bigger than football moment right here. And that's what kind of brings me on to my next point, which is whilst I support the decision, think it's the right thing, I feel like it's a bit inconsistent, to be honest. Right? And it reflects the, uh, the conversation that's been going on a lot about our media reaction in general to the Ukraine. And it asked, I've been talking about this with my friends on a personal level as well. Like, you know, I've been really, really um, devastated, really, by the images that we've seen coming out of Ukraine. And I've, I've felt, quite honestly, I'm much more compelled to do something about it this time than I have in other images. And that's me being really honest. I'm not happy about that. Why is that? I think a major reason is this huge media uh, concentration on this issue that we haven't seen as much in this country, at least, for other similar events. I'm talking about Yemen. I'm talking about what happens in Israel and Palestine. I'm talking about many, many things in Africa, all over the world. They haven't seen this coverage. Now, there's a load of reasons probably for that. This is closer to home, sure. Our media and our government probably feel much more threatened by Putin and Russia than we have from other states where this stuff's been happening, right? But it doesn't make it okay. Now, if we're going to take this, this line... And we're going to really intertwine politics and football, which is something that always comes up as to whether it should happen or not. I think it's unavoidable. I don't think you can have football without politics, such as the size of the sport. But if we're going to take this line on people associated with regimes that are doing bad things, we can't stop here. For me, it's not about, this isn't about football rivalry. This isn't about going, oh, well, Newcastle are doing that and whoever are doing that. It's just got to be blanket. It's just got to be blanket, including my own club. Like if West Ham are doing something like this, I, I ask that it should be done across the board. You know, we have this fit and proper persons test and all this stuff. Like I know it's incredibly hard to prove and I know the guys with so much money are so good at hiding what they really do or don't do. But we can't interfere in one case and not the other. You know what I mean? Where do we draw the line? We're doing this with with Putin and Russia, ultimately because he's invaded another country, he's doing terrible, terrible things. Like I said, I support the fact that we're standing up to him. That's good. But do we not, as a, as a, does the Premier League, for example, and it goes to all leagues, but does the Premier League, for example, is a worldwide supported thing, a league that gets its money from all over the world. Yes, it happens in England, but the people are paying to watch this league and there's a lot of TV right money that's coming in from other continents, let alone countries. Does the Premier League not have a duty to care and interfere and make a difference when people from other countries are hurt and then there's clubs that have associations with people doing those things. By the way, I'm not necessarily saying it's the Premier League as a company's job. I know this is really coming from a government 
perspective now. This is actually the UK government that have issued these sanctions. Actually, the league themselves, I'm not sure how involved they've got at all, or the FA. This is a, a governmental thing, and maybe it has to be. You know, Gary Neville's been calling for a wide review of football for a long time. It needs to be you know, externally reviewed. It can't, it can't ultimately police itself, football. And I, I do agree with that, and I'm in support of that. And myself and Hashtag put our name to Gary Neville's open letter last year for that reason. But this is going to have huge consequences on Chelsea, and I don't know exactly how bad it's going to be, but it's going to be bad, I think. I think it's going to be real bad. You know, I think they're going to... It's going to derail their season this year, I would imagine. Maybe not as much as it will next season. I think it all comes back to how long the sale takes to wrap up, whether they get a buyer who comes in with, you know, the same sort of support that Abramovich has given them over the years, which I think is unlikely because you don't see many owners like that nowadays and how it impacts their transfer business, their ability to retain players that are under contract. You know, there's a lot of good players they could lose for nothing this summer if they can't get these contracts done. At what point, you know, if the if the money is going to be as tight as we think it might be over the next few weeks and months for Chelsea, do they have to start asking their players to fund their own travel? at games you know their own pay they might ask them to take pay cuts for a little bit we've seen it many football clubs before from a football perspective while someone might want to be loyal if they're out of contract they're not protected you know these guys only get certain length of a career if they get injured whilst out of contract who's going to pick them up you know so if I was a player at Chelsea right now and I had you know less than a few months left on my contract I'd be signing terms with another club ASAP. I'm sure there's some Chelsea fans that are going to say that's disloyal and the club's been good to them, etc. This is their career. At the end of the day, they've got families to provide for. Like I said, they've got a short career. Yes, they get very well remunerated for that, but they could quickly find themselves out of pocket if this doesn't sort itself out soon. The big question is, is Abramovich prepared to really walk away, to really do what's right for Chelsea? What's right for Chelsea is for him to give the club away. Now, I know that's walking away from a lot of money. Do I expect him to do it? No. Would it be great for Chelsea if he did do it? Sadly, yes, it would be. Despite the fact he's given Chelsea the most success they've ever had and they've been pretty much the most, if not one of the most successful clubs in England and the world since he took over. You know, in football terms, you can't take away from what he's done. But of course, it's involved crazy expenditure. It's involved inflating the club from a position that it wasn't in before he you know, was there before. But he has done some good there. And football, you have to acknowledge that. You know, The only thing he hasn't really done is improve the stadium, which a lot of other people have done when they've taken over uh, clubs like this. But he has made it a massive brand. They're still, whatever happens, going to be a much bigger club after he goes than he, they were when he picked them up. But it all depends on who the next owner is. If they come in and they are taking money out of the club, like the way we've seen the Glazers do at Man United, or they're, you know any of these American owners tend to run things very differently. If these guys that have you know franchises over in the States and other sports already, it's going to be a very different time for Chelsea. How bad could it get? I don't know. I don't know. I mean... If they stop fulfilling fixtures for some reason, which I don't anticipate they will, because I think the government, you know, giving them special dispensation as a community sort of asset, they can keep playing despite the assets being frozen from Abramovich. I don't think it's going to come to the point of them not being able to fulfill fixtures, because then you're looking at points deductions, you know, you're looking at all sorts. Could they go into administration if they run out of money? Again, points deductions. I, I don't think they're going to get relegated. Obviously, not this season. They've got so many points, but next season. Could they start with negative points? Maybe. Could that lead to a relegation? Possibly. You know, go back a few years. And let's be honest, that this isn't the first time Chelsea have got in trouble under Bromovich's uh, guidance. You know, we've had the transfer embargo. We've had quite a few transfer uh, rule breakings over the years. But more recently, under Frank Lampard, well, I don't think the, 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 the rule break happened when he was there. But whilst he was manager, he obviously had his hand forced. He had to use the younger players because they had a transfer embargo. Ultimately, that was actually quite a good thing for Chelsea. We saw the likes of Mason Mount, Rhys James, really grow into the first team. I don't think they would have got the same amount of minutes if they had not had an embargo. And even people like Tomori and Abraham, who moved on, put themselves in the shop window through playing and got great moves to uh, some big Italian clubs. So Chelsea have got a massive uh, youth system and a massive, uh, famously, sort of stable of players out on loan. Now, the loan rules are changing as well, which is going to mean that's not something they can do going forward anymore. So we're going to see the likes probably of Conor Gallagher coming in and getting a lot of football, which I think was something that Chelsea wanted to do anyway, to be honest, because uh, he's been so good for Crystal Palace. But he's going to be a big part for them next year, I'm sure, if they can't sign players. Not just him. You've got uh, Broja, the, or Broja, I don't even know how you say it, the Southampton striker, He's scoring a lot of goals for Southampton. He's on loan from Chelsea. He could come back and play. So there could be some positives, but are they going to improve from being a Champions League and Club World Cup winning team? Almost certainly not. They could lose a lot of defenders. I mean, Aspi, Rudiger. I think Christensen could be coming to the end of his contract as well. I mean, they're not going to have any defenders left. Chalaba and Saar are going to be massive for the next year if they can't sign new players. Um, Thiago Silva's not getting any younger either, by the way. It's a very interesting time. Um, I do think what's happening is the right thing, but I think it could be 
hugely damaging for Chelsea. Whatever happens, that era is over. I don't see Abramovich coming back from this. I mean, you never say never in football. If the Russian-Ukrainian conflict ends tomorrow and suddenly the sanctions end and he's allowed back to the UK, I don't know. I don't know. Maybe. But for me, it looks like that chapter is over and the best thing for Chelsea Football Club is for him to let them go, hand them over and just take the L and get the heck out of there. And just, if he wants to support Putin's regime and he wants to be part of that, get over there and, and you know, say it with your chest, Roman. Don't sort of try and sit on the fence and pretend you're a good guy and you're going to do these gestures to the Ukrainian guys whilst you're still not walking away from that regime. You've got to do one or the other, in my opinion, or else people are going to ask these questions of you and you're going to be left in a very difficult situation. But this is a bigger issue than football. You know, we're going to obviously look at it with a football lens, but what the government are doing, they're not doing it because of football. They're doing it because there's, there's a country at war completely wrongly you know but our country our government in the uk have now set a precedent a good precedent but i expect to see it continued i expect to see if other uh people in charge of clubs are parts of regimes that are doing things that are you know universally agreed to be not okay it's worth saying by the way then it's not the whole universe that does agree that what russia is doing isn't okay. I think I'm right in saying that China haven't actually come out in support or condemnation of Russia. So there's parts of the world that aren't actually feeling the way we're feeling in this country and the Western countries. But if other regimes continue to do stuff like this and they have links to football clubs, they've got to continue this, surely. Surely. Let's remember this though, guys. We were very slow on the sanctions. Yes, I know we did some and I know we asked him to sell the club and we did whatever. But only really yesterday, as Chelsea were on the way to that trip to Norwich did the real sanctions actually come in against Abramovich? And that is after pressure from other countries who'd done it way before us. So UK were not leading the way in this. I want to hear from you guys. What do you think? Where do you see Chelsea finishing next season? Like after this, there's so many things up in the air we can't really know for sure, right? But it's going to be very interesting to watch it all unfold. I do feel for Chelsea fans. I really hope they can allow you guys to support the club the way you're used to and continue to go to games and do the things you want to do. But just take any money generated from that and put it towards good, positive humanitarian causes in Ukraine rather than into Roman Abramovich's theoretical pockets. But most of all, guys, I hope for a speedy and as peaceful as possible resolution over in Ukraine because it's absolutely shocking to see what's going on over there. Um, and I do hope... Also, it seems like the collective consciousness are starting to realise, whilst it's abhorrent what's going on in Ukraine, and you know we want to save those people that are in those dire straits, we really do, we also need more coverage of when it's happening in other places. And then we as people need to care. You know, We need to really challenge ourselves, myself included here, to take uh, note and feel the way we feel about Ukraine for other countries that are in similar distress. The media are in control of the situation, in my opinion. The media have got to give us the coverage. It was all about COVID for two years. Now it's all about Ukraine. There's been loads of other things going on in the world. There continues to be loads of other things going on in the world that are as bad as what's happening in Ukraine. I'm not playing down the Ukraine situation for one minute. I'm just saying we don't get the coverage of those incidents. And as a result, the governments don't get the pressure on them to do things like what they're having to do with the Russian oligarchs because there isn't the coverage and it doesn't create the groundswell of support against these movements we mentioned whether politics and football should mix and my take on that is it has to it's impossible for it not to football is the world's game whether you like it or not there's no game that's as popular and it infiltrates every country every system every government so when big decisions are made by footballing entities like fifa like uefa like the premier league it has a ripple down effect they let things slide they shouldn't let slide it sets a tone for the rest of business for the rest of sport for the rest of the world in many ways very hard for an entity like football to have a stance and draw a line in the sand where they say what is right and what is wrong because some people think some things are right and some people think those things are wrong. You're never going to please all the people. But I think we can agree on certain basic shared beliefs that killing is wrong in the name of anything. It is wrong. That bombing people is wrong. That taking the lives of children and innocents is wrong. So if countries are doing this, Whatever their reasons for doing it, it has to be condemned. We want to live in peace and not fear. So if huge organisations can help that become a reality, that is what they have to do. We're also seeing Chelsea's sponsors, you know, re renege on their agreements. Yeah, I believe that the, the three sponsors are going to come off the Chelsea shirt moving forward. I've heard other sponsors are considering their position. Football at the boardroom, ultimately, guys, is a game of egos, right? So what the people in charge of football clubs, if they're not going to let their ego take control and if they're... they're best interests of the club or what's actually in their heart and their head have to do is they have to resist the temptation 
to work with people that come with a, a background that could one day put the club in a bad position. You know, I've seen it happen many times, even the low non-league level, the hashtag operate in a club want a quick fix. They want to win something because they've been losing for a while. They want to get promotion or they want to sign a player. So they do a deal with the devil. They trade off their integrity by letting a fox in the hen house and that fox might do great things for the football club. You might make the club a much better place. They might improve the stadium. They might put loads of money in the bank account. They might allow you to win things and feel good as a person. And that's the challenge as football fans we all have to face, which is the juxtaposition of something happening in football that makes you feel good because your team is winning and your life is better as a result. And that's undeniable. If you love football, that happens. But then you have to challenge yourself to say, but the way it's being achieved is bad and then, ultimately, we all have to come out of that feeling bad, despite the fact that our team's winning. It has to be done the right way. And ultimately, winning cannot be winning at all costs. Winning should only feel good when it's done the right way. Do I know what the right way is, ultimately, and how these people in the Premier League and the governments and the FA make football a completely fair place? Is it even possible? I don't know. I don't know. Because every rich oligarch or royal family or whatever they have amazing lawyers at their disposal and they can always find a way to work within the rules even if it's done with bad intent so i don't know how we get this out of football i'm not saying i know i'm just saying the people that ultimately are in charge of the club when they choose to sell to someone they have to try and be better because one thing i do know is if you just operate within the rules the rules that are given to you by a league or a institution if you just say, oh, well, it's within the rules, if you're saying that to yourself when you do something, you maybe know that it's not right. You have to operate from a higher set of rules that are in your own head and your own heart. And it's our job as humans to make sure we have those right sets. So that comes to fans, that comes to people in the boardroom of football clubs that are making decisions on who clubs get sold to and who they let into their football club. If it doesn't feel right, it's probably not right. Whether that ever comes back to bite your football team on the pitch or not, doesn't really matter. We've got to hold ourselves accountable beyond what the rules say we can do and what lawyers can justify on behalf of rich people. I've said my piece. Uh, there's a lot I don't know about this situation. There's a lot I want to know. And if you know more than me, please let me know in the comments. If I've said anything you disagree with, please let me know. Uh, it's a really testing time for the world, let alone football right now. I hope we all come out of it as best as we can. Most importantly, let's hope people in Ukraine do. I'm going to leave a link in the description to some charitable uh, pages that I've donated to that would be great if you guys want to support as well. Uh, take care, guys. Drop a like on the video if you've enjoyed it. Let me know what other videos you'd like to see me make now I'm back. Subscribe for more. Until next time, don't go changing.